Okay, so question number one on our study guide gives us a graph where we have two lines that are intersecting. We know if the lines are intersecting that there is one solution to our equation. We just then need to find out which system provided was the correct modeling of the line there. If we refer back to our linear functions section, we know how to create equations of the line by looking at our y-intercept of the line and the rate of change from that point that tells us then our slope. So we just turn those into equations. So if I'm looking at, let me zoom this in real quick so I can actually see it a little bit more. Okay, there we go. So if I'm looking at, I have my graph here, and one line crosses down and across like that. The other crosses up like this. And I need to find, and, and they intersect at this point, all right? I need to find out what these lines are. So when I'm looking at this one, I look at where it's intersecting, where it's crossing the y-axis. And looking at that, it appears to be at negative 4. So negative, oh, I switch. That's the x-intercept, negative 4, OK? And then from there, I need to go in either direction, but I know because my line is going down as I move across, I know that my slope is negative. So if I look at the intersection of negative four and I go down one and then forward one, my line is crossed there. So I went down one, forward one. If I keep looking at it, it's a continuation of down one, forward one, down one, forward one, which means that my slope is a negative one. Well, we don't put a one in front of it, the X for our slope. We just have it as an X. So I have a negative. So Y equals negative X minus four is one equation. And if I look at my options here, I have a Y equals a negative four X minus four, a negative four X plus one, an X minus four, and a negative X minus four. Well, that gives me a clue. Since I found out one line, there is only one option there that includes that in the answer. Uh, so that is indicating to me that D is going to be our line, or D is going to be our correct system. But let's verify that by looking at our secondary line. It crosses the Y axis here at zero and one. So that means that my slope would be, or my y-intercept would be positive one. The pairing equation has a positive one for slope, so that's, or y-intercept, so that looks good. And then when I follow my line, I see that I do go up three and over two from that point, so three halves x. Both of those equations were there, that's what I saw, so d is going to be the answer for that. Okay? Um, okay, so then it did want us to go ahead and state what is the solution? Where do these two lines intersect? Um, is anybody able to see what that point is? What is our X value? What is our Y value right here? Negative two, negative, or no, negative one, negative two? Um, you were right the first time. It is a negative two. It's a negative two, negative two. Oh, okay. Um, because it was back on the X axis, two spots, and then down on the Y axis, two spots. And then if you weren't 100% sure if that worked out, plug it in. If, I, if, if you plugged in the X and Y values into both of your equations, it would work. Um, so that would just let you make sure that you saw it. I know it's kind of a little harder to see with all those lines when it's handwritten. Um, but yeah, our official solution is negative two and negative two. Okay, so based on that, we need to do the same thing for number three. Okay, so if we are looking at our lines, And I see they are crossing over here. Sorry, we'll pretend that that actually is tied orally. All right, we're going to pretend that is all. I think I actually did it okay. All right, that worked out. All right, so we need to 
find the equations of both of these lines, find out which option that is, and then state the solution. It doesn't really matter which one we look at. Um, we can go ahead and look at this line, this negative line. So where does it cross through the y-axis? What is this point called? Zero. It's at zero. This is called the point of origin because it's where all of the axes are coming out of. So it's kind of their starting point and it has a zero, zero value for the X and Y. So our Y intercept value is zero. And where does it go from there? For starters, is it going to be a positive or negative that it's going? Negative. It's a negative, you bet, because our line is going down as we move right across the coordinate plane. Okay, and how much does it move by? Three, three, one. Three over one. And one of those is a negative because we went down three and then forward one. So y equals negative three over one x plus zero. How can we clean this up? Do we ever leave a number over one? No. No, because it means it's that top number is a whole number. So y equals negative three x. And if we have zero for b, do we need to put a zero? No, because if we don't have a constant, it just means our y-intercept value was zero because we didn't have one. So it means it's right there. So this y equals negative three x is our cleanest equation for that line. Do we happen to see a negative y equals negative three x anywhere? Yeah, see? Oh, there is. There are two of them. Okay, so we are down to, we've ruled out A and D as options. So now B and C are in the running. I didn't even see the second one. Glad you were paying attention, Dina. Okay, um, so that means we got to figure out which one of those equations for the second one is the right one. Is it going to be 2x minus 5 or negative 5x plus 2 and a half? Well, we can kind of figure that out pretty easily just by looking at what value. Yeah, it's I, negative five. The y-intercept, because the for C, it says 2.5, which means the y-intercept for that line would be up here. For B, the y-intercept on the second equation is negative five, which is where it's located. And does it go up two over one, up two over one? You bet it does. So that means our answer is B. Now we have to state the solution. Where do our two lines cross? as an ordered pair. What is our X value? What is our Y value? How far over and then how far down? Three negative or one negative three? Yes, one negative three. We went over, we went forward one on the x axis and then down three on the y axis to get our solution to the equation. And then if we just wanted to double check that, we could plug it in. Oh, yeah, x being one, y equals negative three because negative three times one is negative three. So, boom, that just confirmed that we were on the right track. Okay, so that was our answer to number four. Looking at five, question five says, look at the graph provided and write an equation for each line to generate a system of equation that matches the line. So now the first two gave us a system. Now we have to create our own. So let's go ahead and start with, we have, let me clear off the space. 
going to pause this. So question five gives us a graph that looks similar to this, and we need to create our own equations of the line. And remember, we can just do this in slope intercept form. We just need to make sure that we're identifying the y intercept and the slope value. So we'll go ahead and start with this lower line that has a positive slope. And so where does it cross the y axis? Sorry, Mom, it's just that I want to tell you that. Okay, so if we start with this lower one, where does the line cross through our y intercept? One. At one. So we know we can put that for our b value. And since it was a positive one. Okay, and then what was our rate of change from here? How much did we go up and over or down and back? Well, in this case, sorry, it's up and over. So positive. One half. One half, excellent. So our equation one of y equals one half x plus one because there's our y intercept and our slope from that point. So go ahead and tell me what our second equation is going to look like. Y equals negative one half. Y equals negative one half plus five. Fantastic. Five. Yeah. Yeah. So what is our solution to this system? Four, two, four comma two, or no, four comma, yeah, or four comma three, sorry. Three, there we go. So four and three, and then you can just verify that if you needed to by plugging it in. I know that half of four is two, two plus one is three, so that works. That, so yeah, they had that as a multiple choice for number six, and so the solution would be F. And to go back, I have the answer marked wrong for question number four. It is not no solution. We showed earlier that it had a solution because the lines crossed. The only time we're gonna have no solution is if the graph that we were given had parallel lines. And our solution was one and negative three. Okay, <laughs> here's, this is the one I meant to have that no solution answer on because guess what? Look at those lines. Since they are parallel, we don't have a solution, but we can still figure out what the equations of the line are. We know that they're going to have the same what value so that they are parallel. Slope. Same slope. Fantastic. Yes, because the slope tells the line is rate of change. So if the slopes are the same, the lines are moving at the same rate, but they're crossing at different y intercepts. So what are our two equations? How much are our lines going down by? Because we know they're negative. Because the lines go down. What's our slope? Four over two x. So what is okay. what's the bottom line? What does negative four over two x simplify to? Oh. Two over one. Two over one. So that just means that, yes, we're going to replace that with just a negative 2x, and it's the same slope for both. So where does the top line cross through the y-intercept? Three. And the bottom line? Negative two. There you go. So there's your system. And we have no solution for number eight. Great. Okay, so number nine asks us to identify 
our starting step when we are solving using the elimination method. So if we're looking at the two equations, x plus y equals 10 and 2x minus 3y equals 6, are we going to start? And it might help sometimes um, by instead of just looking at it as a story problem, going on ahead and setting it up as if it were an elimination method that we were actually trying to solve so that we can kind of visualize what is our first step. So I have a 2x minus 3y equals 6. Okay, would we start by adding these two equations together? Would that let us eliminate one of our variables? Just adding those together. No, because when I combine them, if I have an X, a two X, I have three X. Right. I have a Y and a negative three Y, I have negative two Y. So if I combine them as they are, I still have two variables. I haven't eliminated anything. So A is out of the running. Would we multiply the first equation by two and then add them together? Would taking this, multiplying the whole thing by two, let me then eliminate one of my variables? No. Because that will turn everything into, it'd be 2x, 2y, and 20. 2x and 2x is 4x. It's not zero. 2y and negative 3y still leaves me with a negative y. Okay, so that doesn't work. Would we multiply the first equation by three and then add them together? Yes. yes. Because if I have a negative here, I need the y to be positive but the same leading integer so that then they cancel out and then whatever happens to X and the 10 after that. But our first point is to get the same leading inverse number on a variable. So I need a positive and negative of the exact same digit and three is the easiest one to use. All right, so that means that C is gonna be our answer because we do not subtract the equations from each other. Now we get to solve for number uh, 10A. All right, so we need to find the solution to this system, and we can use any method that we like. I'm not grading you on your method. I'm grading you on your answer. So if you have a preferred course of action, use it. All right, what do we think would be the best option for this system? Elimination. I'd say elimination because it's nice and orderly. The X's are lined up, the Y's are lined up, your constants are lined up. It's set up well. And because there's so many numbers involved, using the substitution method and isolating X, then you'd have to multiply everything by a negative to get the negative off of the X. It's a lot of extra work. So we need to get rid of a variable. Which variable are we going to want to get rid of? Does it matter? The X. Let's get rid of the X, you bet. I kind of like to get rid of that leading integer or that leading variable if I can, so that it's just this equals that. It's just my preference, but it really doesn't matter. So how am I going to be able to cancel out my X's? What do I need? Multiply by one. Okay. If I multiply, okay, I'm sorry? Multiply by positive one. Okay. If I multiply by a positive one, absolutely nothing changes. Because anything times I mean, positive is still that same number. Negative one. If I had a negative one, that would let me then have positives. So that would give me that negative positive option to be able to cancel things out. But if I have a positive X and a negative four, does that equal zero? No. No, I need the same number in front of the, the variable, just with different signs. So if here's a negative four, what's the opposite of negative four? Positive four. A positive four. So that means, what would I multiply negative x by to create a positive four x? Negative four. 
a negative four, you bet, so that we get that same leading integer, but then because a negative times a negative, as Arwen had said, is going to then let us have a positive value so we can get that, that inverse, okay? So a negative four times a negative X gives me a positive four X. A negative four times a negative two Y gives me a positive eight Y. And a negative four times a negative five gives me a positive 20. So now I have modified this equation to be something that I can actually solve. So I'm gonna take this one and bring it down here. So I have negative four X minus eight Y equals negative 23. What's my next step? To eliminate the X's, eliminate the Y's. We, we combine our, our like terms. So four and negative four, as, as Dina said, the X's get eliminated. Positive 8y, negative 8y, guess what? The y is getting eliminated. And if I have a 20 and a negative 23, what does that equal? Negative 3. Negative 3. So what is our answer to this system? Zeros don't equal negative 3. No. So what does that mean our answer is? There's no... No solution. Solution. When our variables have been canceled out and the two sides then with the constants that are left over don't equal each other, guess what? There's no solution. If I rewrote these in slope intercept form, they would have the same slope, but different Y intercepts. These would be parallel lines. Hence the reason we have, we have no solution today. There we go. No answer. Okay, let's look at B now. Okay, looking at this system, what is going to be our best method of solving? I'm partial to elimination. <laughs> Most people are. I would say I generally am too, uh, especially again, when you have this many numbers involved. If it's mostly just a bunch of variables and a few small numbers, then substitution is fine. What are we going to eliminate? What is the easiest one to eliminate? The Y. It's going to be the Y. You bet. Because if I needed to eliminate the X, 5 doesn't turn into a 3, and a 3 doesn't turn into a 5. So I would have to modify both of these equations to get inverse leading terms. And that's, that's more work when I just have an 8 here, and I can then have the opposite of that down here. I only have to modify one. So what do I need to modify the second equation by to be able to cancel out my y's? Negative eight. Negative eight, yes, because I need a leading inverse term. If I have a positive eight here, I gotta have a negative eight. So let's start our multiplication. And just for brevity's sake, I'm just gonna go ahead and solve it. The assumption is, you could do this on your own. Holy crap. I mean, okay, I actually need a calculator for this because I'm going to be <laughs> much for brevity. Yeah. There. 22 times 8, 176. And that's going to be negative 176. If I write it correctly, equals negative 176. Okay, because we switched our terms around and now we can then just bring our second equation down. So negative five X positive eight Y equals 24. 24 minus five for the X's leaves me with? Nineteen. 19x. We canceled out our y's. And if I have 176, I have a negative and a positive, which means I have to find the difference between these two. 6 minus 4 is 2. 7 minus 2 is 5 and 1. And my negative was bigger, so my answer is a negative. I have negative 152. How do we solve for x? Divide by 19. We divide the 19 off of it. Leaving with x equals 
So for starters, I have a negative divided by a positive. So what's the sign on my answer? So I don't take a chance of forgetting it. Negative. Negative. And 152 divided by 19. Eight. Eight. So negative eight is supposed to be our solution for X. Negative eight. So what's Y gonna be? What do we do there? I pick a, an equation and I plug in the X. Does it matter which equation we choose? No. Because it's still, it's an eight located on any one of these equations, whether it's the originals, whether it's modified, but I definitely like to stick with the smaller number ones. So okay. let's, all right. Which one are we gonna plug it into? Number one or number two? Do number two. I'm going to say number two, yep, because when we get it by itself, it's going to let us find out what y equals. So negative three times negative eight plus y equals 22. Twenty-four. Uh, Twenty-four plus Possibly. y equals 22. Subtract the 24. Y equals negative two. Y equals negative two, according to this math. But what have I stressed? It's critical to make sure you did it right. So if we did 24 plus negative two, mm. or I mean, so if, <clears throat> We did the negative three X, so that was 24, right? Uh -huh. And then we plug in the negative two for the Y. Uh -huh. That equals 22. Uh -huh. But how do I know it works for everything? Then you have to plug it into the top one too. You have to plug it into both equations. Yeah. We know right. that this works for the second equation because that's how we got our second value. We know it's true there. Right. to make sure that our math wasn't off somewhere, that we didn't accidentally drop a negative or something, it has to also work in the second equation. This, this is so important. I can't even tell people how many times they just would have plugged it into both. They would have realized, oh, I dropped a negative. I need to go back and fix that. And then they would have gotten it right. But because they're like, oh, it works for this one. It must work for everything. Not necessarily. You got to prove it. Math likes proof. So we plug in our X. We plug in our Y and we figure out, does this work? Negative five times negative eight. Forty. Forty. Eight times negative two. Sixteen. Negative sixteen. When I combine those, do I get twenty-four? Yup. So there we go. It just lets us have peace of mind. Yes, our answers are correct. We're going to get full credit for it. This, though, on the test is the only thing I'm actually grading you on. But you have to do all of this lovely, lovely work to get there. So question six and on are going to be problems that you see on the test. You are only going to be graded on that you have defined your variable and what it represents and what that solution is. But you should do this four step process for each of them to make sure you have a clear logical process to follow. So it starts with one, we need to define our variable. So A, uh, define our variable. Okay, so define M takes up too much space. All right, so start by, okay, so we define our variable, we set up a system, we solve the system, and then we state our answer, four steps, okay? A school spent $860,000 in one year to pay all of its teachers and administrators. The school has a total of 24 teachers and administrators combined. 
if the teachers make up 30, uh, if the teachers make $35,000 per year and the administrators make $40,000 per year, how many teachers and how many administrators does the school have? So first, we got to define what are the two things that we don't know? We don't know the number of teachers or administrators. You bet. So X is going to represent number of teachers. And Y is going to, oh, I don't know why I just put Y, okay. And the number of admin. Okay, now that we have variables defined, we can start putting in the facts that we know into an equations. What do we know about teachers and administrators? The teachers make 35,000 per year. Okay. And the administrators make 40,000 per year. Okay. So generally in our, in our systems, we have two different types of things going on. We have a quantity and we have a, um, a, a cost or a value equation. So we can go ahead and start with the value one or the monetary equation. So everything in there is related to expenses. So we know that each teacher makes $35,000. Do we know how much, how many teachers are making that? Right. No. So how do I express the amount that the teachers get paid as a whole? Teacher one gets paid 35,000. Teacher two gets paid 35,000. Teacher three gets paid 35,000. If we have this repetition of 35,000, how multiplying? We multiply it by X. So 35,000 X. And what do the administrators make? 40,000. 40,000 per admin. So we multiply it by the number of admin that we have. And what do we know about this value? What is our total? 860,000. 860,000. So we have our money equation. Now we need a quantity equation. What do we know about the number of teachers and the number of administrators? Um, there's a total of 24. 24. So how do we get the total of 24? Where does that come from? If you add the teachers and the administrators together. We add the two together. So the number of teachers, number of admin create as gives us a total of 24. So we have our quantity and our cost equations. And now we can start figuring out, well, how do we want to solve this? What method do we want to use? Elimination. Elimination. So just for, so what variable, I'm going to put this up here just to make writing our modified equation fit right underneath of it and make it a little more logical. What am I going to multiply this equation by so that I can eliminate one of my variables? A negative 35,000. I like it. Negative 35,000. Okay. Which is going to give me negative 35 thousand X minus 35,000 Y equaling, and we need a calculator, um, 35,000 times 24 is going to give me 840,000. And because it was a positive times a negative, it is a negative 8,400,000. Now I can combine like terms. X's are gone. If I have 400,000 and I take 35, or not 400,000, sorry, 40,000 and I take 35,000 away, how much remains? 5,000. 5,000. And if I have 860 and I take away 840, how much does that leave me with? 20,000. 20,000. So, 5,000, how many times gives me 20,000? Four. Four. So according to our math, 
How many administrators do we have? Four. Four. Well, if we have four of those, how many teachers do we have? 20. 20, because we needed a total of 24 members, okay? So this was our stated, write a system. I had gotten, there we go. Write a system, solve it, and then state your answer. So I included it right back up at it. So on your test, I'm looking for that you did this and pair an answer to it. You did this, you paired an answer to it. This stuff you will have on your scratch paper, but I'm not grading you on it. Because if these aren't right, then that means you messed up somewhere here. Okay? Um, and then how do you prove that that worked out? How do we prove? Plug it in. Plug it in to the second <laughs> equation. If I have 20 times 35,000, so 20 times 35,000 gives me 700,000. And if I have 40,000, four times, four times four, 16, and then I have five zeros with it. Well, 700 and 160, is 860. So yes, our values were correct and we validated that by plugging it into both equations. Okay, so we have a story problem number eight. I've skipped seven. Uh, number eight says Brad plans to invest a total of $6,000. Part of it into an account at 2% interest, annual interest, and the rest in an account at 8% annual interest. So how much should he invest in each account so that the total interest in one year will be $192. So we need to start by defining what are the two things that we don't know? We don't know the amount he should invest in each loan. You bet. So we're going to say the X is the amount in, um, is it account, account one. And the amount in account two. Okay, so I like to start with my quantity equation before my cost equation. So what in its simplest form do I know about the quantity of X and Y? The percentages of the, of the interest. Well, there's that, that's gonna deal with our money one, like our, our, our calculating total costs and stuff. But Brad is investing what? A total of $6,000. So our, our quantity is 6,000 is being invested. And where does that 6,000 go? Being going in account one and account two. So usually, Usually, in most situations that we're encountering like this, where our, our leading equation is going to be an X and Y gives us this total amount. Then what else do we know about how we reach this total or what's involved with this total and these values? OK, so. On OK, so on these types of story problems, I, I generally, especially when interest is involved, I like to actually make myself a chart. And this is going to help me set up the second equation, which can be with these investments and percentages can be a little more confusing. So I have, so we have um, this, so we so we'll make this low, uh, account one, account two, and totals. Okay, so account one is represented with um, X, account two is represented with Y, and we have a total of $6,000 being invested. Okay, 
So what else do I know about account one? What are some additional details it gives me? Well, one of it has a 2% annual interest. Okay, so a 2% APR. Okay, the other one is an 8% APR. 8% APR, okay. Now, what do we know about dealing with percentages? Make them into decimals. <laughs> Gotta make them into decimals. And what else has to be with that percent? The coefficient. It is the coefficient. <laughs> the X or the Y? Yes, the actual amount. This is 2%, but 2% uh, of X. Right. Of means multiplication. So let's start by converting our percent into a decimal. What is 2% as a decimal? 0 0.02. 0 0.02, you bet. Because if you think of it as two cents out of a dollar, you're getting an interest of two cents out of every dollar you invest. Two cents times however many dollars you put into the account. So 0.2x. So how about y? How are we going to express the interest that we make off of account y? 0 0.08y. And then what do I know about the totals related to interest? 12% or 10%? Would it be the would the total be 10%? Uh, no, no, good. That would be a good try. We're not actually adding these. There's a total value associated with these interests based from the story. $192. $192. We make $192 off of 2% of X's account and 8% of Y's account. So now I have this that I turn into an equation. I know that 2% of X and 8% of Y gives me $192. We have a couple options here. I don't know about you. I'm not a huge fan of working with decimals. I, think I get things tripped up. We can clear the decimal. Any guess as to how we do that? How many decimal places do we need to get rid of? Two. Two. So the way that I can increase a number's value by two decimal places is I multiply it by a number with two zeros in it. I multiply it by 100. Because if I have two pennies 100 times, guess what? I got two bucks. If I have eight pennies 100 times, I got eight bucks. And now I just take the 192 and tack two more zeros onto it to make 19,200. Now I don't have to work with decimals and I'm less likely to mess something up because we'll just be honest, decimals and just keeping track of those little details can be frustrating. So we get rid of them. So whenever you have a story problem or an equation and there's multiple, you know, you have some decimals and you want to clear them out, you multiply everything by the largest decimal place value that you have. So if one of these had been a 0.2, I still would have had two decimal places here. So I still would have needed to multiply everything by 100. If they were both just one decimal place, then I only would have needed to multiply by 10 but I needed to move it over two so that everything could be a whole number. Now, this is gone. I'm, I have this equation and the second equation. What do I want to do? Elimination. 
So we're obviously going to eliminate, we're going to modify our smaller digit equation. What are we going to multiply it by? Negative two. Go with a negative two so that I can get the X is eliminated, negative two Y equaling negative 12,000. So then I can cancel out my X's. Eight minus two leaves me with six Y. And is that 7,200? Mm -hmm. All right, so then if I have 7,200 divided by, six, sorry. I'm, <laughs> it did work out right. I was mental mathing it and it wasn't coming out right, but I had the calculator. There we go. So Y is saying that it is 1,200, right? Right. Okay. So if this is the amount that I have invested in account Y or my second account, how much had to be in account one to have a total of 6,000 altogether? Plug it in. Plug it in, plug it in. 4,800. 4,800. Okay, we know that works for account A, but we need to plug it in to our interest to double check that gap that gave us $192. If I take 4,800 and I multiply it by 0.02, 4,800 times 0.02. That gives me 96, okay? So I had $96 in interest from account one. And if I take 1,200 and multiply it by 0 0.08, I get another 96. 96 twice is 192. So it worked out. Yeah. There we go. Okay, um, the last thing to be aware of in number nine, we don't have time to go over it. There's an explanation, you know, there's something to follow in number nine. The issue with number nine is it gives you two different units of measurement. It says this amusement park is offering half an hour, 30 minute or 60 minute laser tag options and that there were a total of 30 hours of laser tag played. You cannot just plug those numbers in as they are because you're dealing with two different units of measurement. You have to convert to one or the other. You can convert your hours into minutes or you can convert the minutes values into its approximation of hours. Well, if you have 30 minutes, how much of an hour is that? Half. Half an hour, so you can say 0.5. So using the 0.5, for X, and if you have 60 minutes, how much of an hour is that? One. One. So that just means it's Y. Gives you the total of the 30 hours, okay? So this is gonna come into play. You know that there were uh, 38 people visiting the park. Okay, so you don't know, some did half an hour sessions, some did full hour sessions, but you don't know how many people did each session. So uh, one business, so how many people participated in the 30 minute session? So we'd say number of people in 30 minute session, okay? Y is gonna be the number of people in the 60 minute session, okay? And then the values I know about that, I know that the number of people in the first, in the short sessions and the number of people in the large sessions totaled 38 people. And then if we make it, so here's a quantity, and then we need one about the other type of value occurring, which is time. And what do I know about the time? Half an hour times all of the people in that session, plus a full hour of all of those people gives us a total of 30 hours. So this is your setup to be able to solve this system. 
Not the exact same context in the test, but it is a matter of you maybe being given uh, maybe being given seconds to minutes. Again, two different units of time. You have to convert to one or the other. And one method is easier. You could have, in this situation, we could have converted it to minutes, but then we're dealing with much larger numbers. Doing it in terms of hours, way simpler, smaller numbers, easier to handle. <laughs> 